plus five. Now we want to know how do we calculate J experimentally. Okay. So based on J integral, there are many um, standards. So it's not. So you can find out initiation factor toughness from this. This is J one C. But J1C, because J integral is applied for ductile materials, so you don't have PQ kind of thing like you do in K. Okay, so in that case, in this case, in J integral testing, load displacement curve will be very long. Okay, so. So you have J1C, then you can have J versus delta A curve, then you can calculate KJC also from J for brittle materials. And for these two, you have ASTM E1820, and for this, you have E1921, and we will see how to do that. But Basically, the so experimental J integral was how do you find find out how can you calculate or measure J integral experimentally? So J is a line integral, okay? So that is W G by minus E del U by del X D X. Yes, this is the J integral, and W is whatever is the value of strain sigma dot d epsilon. So that is your strain energy density. Okay. For case of so, if it, it would have been Griffith, then it would have been half into stress into strain because there it was just straight line and triangular thing. But in this case, it's a curve, so you have to take the area under the curve. Okay, so sometimes this is also represented as phi in literature. So how do we calculate this experimentally? How do we measure this experimentally? So we have also seen that J is equal to del u by del a. This definition is also there. And for two-dimensional case. You will have one by b. Mm. So per unit energy released, per unit increment in crack, per unit thickness of the sample. So how do we measure it experimentally? That is good. So many people would have tried the second expression, but nobody would have dared, and so far dared, to try finding the J integral experimentally using the line integral equation, the first expression. Okay, <coughs> but Reed has done it long back when, and before it was done experimentally, and. What he did was, he took a SENT specimen. So you have a pin here, you have a pin there, and you put it in the machine, and then you just uh, stretch <coughs> it like a tensile specimen. And this is a flat tensile specimen with a crack in it, with a surface crack. Okay. And then he described a contour that he will take the value of the line integral. 
on this country. Okay. So how will he calculate the values of line integer along this path? If you have to do this, how will you do it? So what value can you take out? So at every point on this contour, you need stress, you need strain. Okay? What else do you need? That's it. So this can come from stress and strain. This can come from stress. You have to measure displacement also. From displacement you will calculate strain. Okay? So how will you measure those things at different points? So he puts a lot of strain gauges, okay? So a lot of strain gauges he puts at different locations. Then he puts a COD gauge here, which will measure the crack opening displacement. Then he puts an LVDT here. He puts another LVDT here. He puts another LVDT here. And then he does the test. Okay. But this kind of testing is very cumbersome. In one specimen, you have to put a lot of small strain gauges, big strain gauges, 3, 4 LVDT, COD gauge. And then you have to do the line integration at different points with an approximation that interpolates linearly between the two measurement points. Okay. So this is not practical, but it is done. So experiments should be performed to check whether whatever is said in theory is correct or not. It doesn't matter if it is practical or not, but somebody should do it. Okay. And everyone waits for others to do it. <coughs> so then after Reed, Landis and Bagley, they do the test for the first time. And they take the second expression. Okay. And how do they do the test? They take uh, n number of specimens, so let us say 20 specimens. So 20 CT specimens. And each specimen is made up of from the same heat of the material. So it's the same material, same heat. What is the heat? Heat print. Heat print. What is the heat? What is the heat? Metallurgical. <laughs> Not that heat. So it's a metallurgical term. When you make steel, okay, so whatever comes out from one furnace is one heat. When you change the furnace, so how do you make steel? You don't know? Who is again here? Steel kaise banate honge? I don't know, just mix it. Kaise mix karenge? For mixing, I have to molten so whatever we study in our uh, classes that you put chromium, niobium and all those things, who is actually putting them in the furnace? Some labors are putting. How do they know that which is chromium and which is vanadium and which is molybdenum? From the color of the sack. Okay. And in a lot of industry, you will see that they just throw the sack in the furnace. ठीक है वैनेडियम का बोरा उठाया फेंक दिया स्टील में अब बोरे का क्या होगा इवैपोरेट इवैपोरेट हो जाएगा और जो भी इंप्योरिटी है उसके साथ वो स्लैग में चली जाएगी ओके सो दे आर नॉट बॉदर्ड दैट इट इज इट रियली क्रोमियम और नॉट इफ यू मिस मैच द सैक देन इंस्टेड ऑफ क्रोमियम यू विल हैव समथिंग एल्स इन द स्टील ओके सो स्टील इफ इट इज मेड फ्रॉम बेसिक ऑक्सीजन फर्नेस or Lindstone or LD furnace or electric arc furnace, whatever furnace you are using and then you are <coughs> doing secondary refining. So the final processing after that, so that is one heat. And each heat can have different composition. A little bit variation can be there. So you will have chances of changes in property because of change in the heat. So let us say your furnace is of 20 ton capacity. 
so that 20 ton is homogeneous supposedly homogeneous also depends on cooling surface will have different properties center will have different properties <coughs> but more or less it will be same and if you take the second 20 ton of the same composition it will have a little variation in the composition and so ek hi khana bana rahe hain usme namak dalna hai masala dalna hai par ek hi aadmi do bar banayega to thoda variation to ho jayega usi ko heat bol so from the same heat he takes some samples and all of them are of the same material so there is no change because of material property and then he makes samples of different crack lengths okay so each sample will have different crack lengths and then he loads it they load it and they load it not until crack starts propagating that they don't do so there is no crack propagation here okay and then what do you do you will get load versus displacement curve okay so for each crack length you will have a different curve right and the smallest one is for the largest curve so this is a1 a2 a3 a4 a5 and a5 is larger than a4 and so on from this curve they find the area under the curve okay and that should represent the energy absorbed for the same amount of displacement okay <clears throat> so this becomes u5 this total becomes u4 and so on okay then you plot u versus a for each crack length for each specimen you are getting one value of u Right? Or you are getting different values of u. So you can take a continuous area measurement versus delta. Okay. And then you plot u versus a. And then the slope of this curve will be giving you del u by del a. Right? And that will give you z integral. So you see that slope is changing at different place. So you will have z versus delta a. For different crack lengths, so you will have j versus a. You can also so there is no delta a here. Delta a would be a one minus a two, a two minus a three, and so on. Right? This is what <coughs> Landis and Bradley do to find out experimentally the value of the integral. <coughs> what is the problem in this case? Is it the best possible way to do it, or could there be a better way of doing it so just after landis and bradley proposed this in a very less amount of time rice also proposes another method and that is multi specimen so this is multi specimen approach which landis and bradley are doing and he proposes that you can also do it from a single specimen and again, yeah. No, you can stop at any displacement. That displacement should be same for all the specimens. load different apply Specimen We are stopping at same amount of displacement. You see that the force versus displacement? And the vertical line that is constant delta right so even if a little bit larger or a smaller displacement happens in different machines you will do the analysis for a constant displacement only so you can select your data beyond that displacement you will not take the data same Plasma 
अलग अलग लोडिंग कंडीशन पे दिखाएगा तो दैट इज अबाउट स्ट्रेन हार्डनिंग राइट वो तो टेंसाइल टेस्ट में भी होता है तो इसमें क्रैक है ऑलरेडी तो प्लास्टिसिटी में तो जा रहा है ओके एंड वी आर इन द कंडीशन वेयर प्लास्टिक डिफॉर्मेशन इज सिग्निफिकेंटली लार्जर देन अर्बन स्केल सो डिसलोकेशन फिनोमिना डैमेज फिनोमिना ऑल ऑफ दोज आर हैपनिंग ऑल ऑफ दोज आर हैपनिंग इन ऑल द स्पेसिमेंट फॉर हायर अमाउंट ऑफ फोर्स यू आर समर दैट यू आर समर दैट सो इट इज डिफाइनिंग स्ट्रेस स्ट्रेन बिहेवियर ऑफ द सेम मटीरियल इट इज दीज आर नॉट डिफरेंट मटीरियल दे विल हैव डिफरेंट अमाउंट ऑफ हार्डनिंग बट ऑल दोज हार्डनिंग कैन बी डिफाइंड बाई द सेम स्ट्रेस स्ट्रेन कर दे विल हैव द सेम हार्डनिंग फ्लो राइट इफ यू अनलोड एंड रीलोड देन दैट or if you do compression in between or if you change the strain rate in between those things will hamper the material property in a way that you cannot justify the value which you get at the end belongs to the same material if you change the strain rate then hardening changes the stress strain curve will change okay so as long as this is the strain curve can be given by one constitutive relation one ro equation you are good to do what you are doing okay none of the specimen will be in elastic condition none of them because we have a crack okay so rice proposes that you can do the same thing without testing n number of specimen because if you are doing 20 specimen 10 specimen then the problem is first of all it is not very practical because we will have to make a lot of specimen and second thing is that every specimen will have some difference at some scale so if i ensure that the thickness is 25 mm some of them might have 24.5 or some might have 24.95 some might have crack length different some might have different crack tip root radius so when you do fatigue pre cracking you are ensuring that a by w should be in the range of 0.45 to 0.55 or 0.7 in that range you cannot really control exactly when you will stop the fatigue pre cracking right so you have loaded the nosed specimen under fatigue loading and then you are with your eyes you are looking at the sample and you have mark on the sample so if this is the sample metallic material then you polish this surface before doing the fatigue pre cracking you don't have to do very good polishing because you don't want to see microstructure there but enough polishing you have to do using paper emery paper so that it becomes reflective okay and then you you load it under cyclic conditions and then after some amount of time a crack will initiate and you will be able to see a hairline crack very very thin crack very very thin so you should be good in your eyes color blindness is not a problem but you should be able to see okay so you have marked that in order to reach 0.5 i should have fatigue pre crack here until there right and you also know that because it is j testing this is not going to be a plain strain situation or completely plain strain situation okay so the crack is going to grow more inside rather than outside because you will have high constraint at the center <coughs> so crack will grow more in the center and less on the surface okay so for in order to reach a value of a by w is equal to 0.5 let us say that you want to do a pre cracking of 1 mm 
so then you will draw a line at 0.9 millimeter or so okay so then you think that a little bit more will be there inside and so the average should come out to be 0.5 right so based on your eyes you will stop but then you do not know where exactly it has stopped at what scale that line is defining that line which you have scratched you are not supposed to ink it you are not supposed to draw with a marker you are not supposed to put any ink at the crack test never people used to do it before but then it interacts with the crack and causes corrosion so changes the material property <clears throat> so you need to do a scratch with a knife or something with a blade Base is the scratch so that you can only see it shouldn't be very deep you are not supposed to create another crack the, okay one gauge for that huh? gauge is there for marking this yeah so whatever you have you can do it you can't do it with your nails teeth you can try maybe <laughs> <laughs> okay so so we don't know if so this a by w so this crack length will not stop at 1 mm and then when you when you have broken the sample then you will see that the crack tip initially was like this so here you said that it should be 0.9 mm so in some case you don't know what is inside you can't see what is inside okay so you might have some inhomogeneity or something if nothing is there it should look like this so this might go to a higher value so that the average is more than 0.5 a little bit more than 0.5 that can happen and this difference will be there in each specimen so you have a different a by w well you are actually ensuring different a by w in this multi specimen approach because you want to have different crack lengths okay and every so even from the same heat the definition of homogeneous material is or any homogeneous solution is that you take random specimens and they should give the same composition okay but random does not mean that you will not have any pattern sometimes a pattern is also a part of randomness okay if you have read about homogeneous nucleation from liquid to solid how does that happen or homogeneous nucleation of dislocation how does that happen so when liquid is getting solidified suppose you have liquid and then you are cooling it so all the atoms are moving okay in whatever way they are moving because they are liquid <clears throat> and then the temperature drops below melting point so you have a driving force because of delta t because of supercooling you have a driving force which compels the liquid to freeze to become a solid the movement is not allowed because temperature is now not that much so atoms cannot move that much okay so they will stop and if they prefer to have lower energy when we when they form an ordered structure then they will form a crystal and if they cannot form an ordered structure they will form an amorphous material the atoms will sit wherever they want to sit okay so if you cool very fast any crystalline material can become amorphous because you are not providing sufficient amount of time for atoms to sit on these seeds if you don't have these seeds so you can imagine this to be a bus which is empty so you and there are 20 seeds and you send 10 people they will sit on the seeds okay they will choose their seeds preferable seeds and they will sit if you send exactly 20 then all the sites will be filled and all of them are sitting exactly at the sites there will be some people who will not like to sit and they will be standing on the gates for whatever reason okay so those are defects <clears throat> and those defects will be there but in 20 sites if you send 50 people then what will happen then th that order will not be maintained some of them will be sitting on the seats and some of them will be sitting on each other's head okay so there is no lattice parameter so that is amorphous because you are not providing sites and the site is not available in this case because you are not providing time 
and temperature both okay so out of randomness you can have a scenario what what does randomness means that you can't really decide what is happening if you decide something is happening then it is not random that's why computer algorithms are called pseudo random algorithms because they are not really random those random number generators which you have in python or matlab or whatever those random numbers are not generated randomly they are generated following an algorithm so that means you are breaking randomness okay why was i discussing this yeah so because of this random behavior you will have different values of defects inclusions carbides in all the specimens and they will not be uh the same scenario so they are not same 20 specimens from the same heat same material are not same okay because you don't have control on all the dimensions on all the composition okay and then you have manufacturing problems so if you are making holes the holes will also have some tolerance each hole will not be of same diameter in every specimen so all those things are there and those will contribute, all of them will contribute to a large error. All of them individually are smaller, but they will contribute to a large error in your measurement. So one problem is practicality and another problem is the error which is coming because of making too many specimens. So you want to have one specimen if it is possible. So what Rice says that you can do it by one specimen and he <coughs> derives for three point bend specimens and we are not going to discuss that derivation and he derives that you can calculate J integral by finding out the elastic J integral and plastic J integral okay so he takes a three point bend specimen and he says that the opening in the bend specimen will be comprising of the <coughs> angular opening so theta and that will be comprising of the angular movement which can happen if there was no crack and if there was a crack. And then he assumes that the angular displacement which will be happening if there was no crack will be much smaller in comparison to crack. <clears throat> and then he calculates u, okay, so with an integration of bending moment and d omega. And then he comes to the conclusion that you can calculate the integral with the elastic displacement and plastic part of the displacement. And J elastic can simply be calculated from the force which you have at that point and follow the formula for stress intensity factor because that comes from theory of elasticity. So that should be defining the elastic J integral. So that will be simply k square by E. Okay, and this k is calculated from all the same formula which we have discussed in plane strain factor coupling. Okay, so if it is three point bend specimen, then k will be p into the, the span length divided by the thickness into w to the power 1 by 2. Is it 1 by 2 or 3 by 2? So this is millimeter, so you have Newton millimeter, millimeter, root millimeter. So Newton per millimeter square we have to do. So if we multiply with root, then we'll have millimeter here. So then this will become millimeter square. So that becomes MPA. This becomes MPA. And then you have, I should have, so one millimeter is wrong. So I should have three by two three by here. Okay. So, and then you have a function of A by W, of A by W. And this is how you calculate k and divide by the elastic modulus, you get the first term of J integral. The plastic part of J integral comes from the load displacement area. And then he defines a factor multiplied by area into the ligament length and into the thickness. This is defining the second part. Of the nice. So this is the area under load displacement curve. 
okay and then there has to be a factor so this is area which is representing energy so energy per unit thickness per unit crack length so b is w minus a so the rate will be same okay so this is simply del u by del x but you need to have a factor which correlates this area with the real energy and this factor after his derivation comes out to be 2 later it was changed to 1.99 it really matters if you don't put 1.99 or 1.9 i'm not so sure you can't put 1.9 also for 1.99 or you can't even make it 2 okay so you have to use that value and for rice's derivation this was 2 so 2 into area plastic divided by b into b so you have to remove the elastic part from the load displacement curve okay so this is what rice gives and then comes the single specimen approach to calculate the value of j integral and you also want to find out j integral with the variation of delta a okay so you want to have so what is happening in these materials these are ductile materials so in ductile materials crack is propagating stably there is no catastrophic failure unless you load it for a very long time not time so very high value of displacement okay even then they cannot have some of the material for example a lot of steels we have today they will not fail in catastrophic manner at room temperature we don't make brittle steels these days okay so you are going to get a lot of stable ductile crack growth so slow ductile crack growth okay and therefore you want to know how the j integral changes with crack growth okay there is no one value which can define what is happening in the material or how the crack growth will develop with increase in the force or displacement okay so the single specimen technique <coughs> says that you take one specimen and then you load it okay and then you unload it for a value should be smaller than 20 percent of the load you have achieved okay not much of unloading and then you reload it and then you unload it, reload it, unload it, reload it, and so on, and keep going, and then you stop somewhere. And then you calculate J. So each of these unloading points represent one specimen. If you put it equivalent to Landis and Bailey's multi-specimen technique, then at this point, certain amount of crack growth has happened. So when you reload it, that represents another specimen with a different crack length. Okay. So you will have to calculate J integral at this point, at this point, and so on. And at every point, you will have different elastic modulus in your calculation. And that elastic modulus, well, elastic modulus will not change, but the stiffness will change, and that stiffness will come in the calculation of area plastic. Elastic modulus will not change. Okay. So, with single specimen technique, we can calculate without using too many specimens, we can calculate the behavior of J integral with different amount of crack lengths and that appears to be so you will have some experimental data and something like that you will have because at every point you are calculating data you will do more than one test and even in one test even in one test you will have at every point you will have different values of j and if you plot them they will not necessarily come in a pattern okay so then you have to ensure statistically important data so the data should be statistically significant if you have two data you can draw a straight line you can draw any, any polynomial so that is not a statistically significant data 
So then ASTM 1820 defines that you must have certain values in certain delta A value. Okay. So if you divide the delta A in the range of 0.1, so each interval is 0.1, then you must have certain data in each interval. Only then you can conclude anything from this. Okay. The other problem is that although you are calculating J versus delta A using this technique, but there is some contribution of blunting also here. Because initially crack tip will just get blunt and it will not open up really. But you will get displacement value increasing. Okay. So for the calculation of J integral, you need the displacement value. So you can take either the load line displacement or you can put a COD gauge and you can have COD crack opening displacement. So you see that here the points are opening and they are also deforming plastically. Okay. But these holes are not deforming plastically. So on this, on this region, you don't have plastic deformation happening because you don't have that much amount of force here. Your plastic zone is somewhere here, right? So all the other things are not deforming plastically. Okay. So the displacement for the same amount of force which is happening elastically is going to be different from what you will have at the crack tip. So COD and LLD will have differences. So if you are taking load line displacement, then you need to have a formula which can correlate this displacement to the displacement which is happening at the crack tip. Okay. If you take COD, then also you have to have some relation. And that relation is taken care of by the displacement calculation relation with COD, which is a function of A by W and eta factor. Okay. So apart from this, you are also measuring force from the load cell. And how do you measure the crack length? Because you have delta A also. So you are supposed to measure delta A also. So how will you measure delta A? In multi-specimen technique, it was pretty easy. Right? So you load the specimen to 5 millimeter, then you stop the test and then you break it in fatigue again. Why do we break it in fatigue again? So in multi-specimen testing, I take a specimen, okay, and I had to load it to some amount of displacement value, <coughs> okay. So let us say this is 5 millimeter. So I have loaded this sample to 5 millimeter, some deformation has happened. Okay. And if there is any crack growth or not, we are not supposed to have a crack growth in this case. But if there is any, how do we ensure? So you stop the test after 5 millimeter of displacement. And after that, what do you do? You do fatigue again to break the whole sample. Why are you doing fatigue? Even in this case, when you stop the test here, you are supposed to break it by fatigue. Why fatigue? Because you want to measure how much crack growth has happened. <coughs> how much crack growth has happened because while the test? Okay. When you break the specimen, how are you breaking? By propagating the crack. So how will you differentiate between the crack which has come during the testing and the crack which has come because you have broken the sample after the test? How will you see that? Where is that point beyond which I have broken and before which the crack growth happened due to the test? How will you differentiate that? Fatigue mm -hmm. so reason hai. So we break it in fatigue so that we can clearly see the difference between the crack growth which has happened during the monotonic loading and in fatigue. So people before this used to do by heat tinting. So they have they will stop the test somewhere and then they will put a furnace around the sample and they will just heat it. Okay, there is some temperature where you are supposed to heat it for certain duration and that heating 
will what will how it will work there is no load you have stopped the test
who has described this theory and said that you cannot unload because if you unload it will not follow the same path so it will not remain non-linear elastic material the same guy is saying thoda kar sakte hain itna chalta hai 20 par usse zyada nahi karna gadbad ho jayega okay so you can't really unload completely and do the heat tinting this argument must be justified by experimentally finding the truth right ki unloading kar sakte hain ki nahi kar sakte hain theoretically to nahi kar sakte okay not only this you are also breaking the concept of unloading because crack is growing now crack growth was also not allowed in rice's theory and rice is only proposing this okay so not only unloading crack growth is also happening which is called causing another unloading and in all those areas j integral is not valid and we are still using it itna chalta hai not only that people went beyond this idea and they have used j integral in fatigue crack growth also fatigue to clear cut unloading hai usme to wahan tak karna padega niche tension compression ho gaya to पर वहां भी यूज करते हैं क्योंकि एक बार आपने ये शुरू कर दिया ना कि सर आंसर ही तो गलत था देन देर इज नो लिमिट टू दिस देन तो सर मन नाम तो लिखा है नंबर दे दो ओके सो बट एक्सपेरिमेंटली इट वर्क्स एक्सपेरिमेंटली सो अ लॉट ऑफ एप्लीकेशन ऑफ साइंस यू विल सी वेयर थ्योरी वाज नॉट नोन बट एक्सपेरिमेंटली इट स्टार्टेड वर्किंग देन पीपल got killed and died and all those things then he must be knowing about madam curie and his husband pierre curie they were working on pitch blende the ore of ore of what uranium uranium <coughs> or x ray discover hua x ray use ho gaya medical mein seedhe seedhe aa gaya who was that person who took the picture of his wife's uh, hmm. hand hmm. roentgen or somebody क्या करें कैसे क्रैक ग्रोथ मेजर करें बताओ कुछ आइडिया दो कुछ दिमाग लगाओ इंजीनियरिंग का कोई आइडिया आ रहा है दिमाग में सो यू मस्ट बी ए फिजिसिस्ट टू बी अ ट्रू एक्सपेरिमेंटलिस्ट यू मस्ट हैव द नॉलेज ऑफ फिजिक्स यू मस्ट लुक एट थिंग्स बियॉन्ड द वेरी कोर एरिया ऑफ वेयर यू आर लुकिंग एट यू मस्ट नॉट हैव अ वेरी नैरो विजन ओके so the idea comes from resistance if you pass electric current and all of them are metallic materials conductors so if you pass electric current and then you have this much area which is initially intact okay so current will have a path okay so resistivity <coughs> is the property of the material so the resistance which you are going to get for a constant value of voltage drop is going to be the resistivity into whatever length divided by area this is the area right and when crack grows this area changes so the change in resistance will be giving you how much crack growth has happened so you can measure the change in resistance and then you have to calibrate with the crack growth and prove your formula theory will give you a formula that fine if there is this much amount of resistance change then this much amount of crack growth must have happened another problem is there <clears throat> so this crack growth is one value now at every point you are getting one value of crack growth okay so 0.2 mm hua 0.6 mm hua 1 mm hua crack growth 
but it is not one value along the thickness it's a different value so crack is growing not uniformly like a straight line this is a fatigue pre crack okay this is the notch and then you have a fatigue pre crack that also is not uniform and then the crack growth sometimes happens like this if you have side grooves then the crack growth will be something like this but nevertheless in the analysis you can't really use n number of crack delta a value for one point calculation so at each point you really need one value only okay so and that you are getting from that potential drop method so that is called and you are passing direct current not alternating current so that is called direct current potential drop method of crack growth measurement okay so that is called dcpd and you have to supply a current by putting a screw and then wire it and then you take the voltage drop and the standard says that you have to weld it diagonally opposite so you maximize the path minimize the error of the current of the voltage drop and then you measure the voltage drop and then you find out how much crack growth has happened okay so with these values you will get these data and then you will have either you fit it okay so i was also talking about that you will have some blunting okay and that blunting will be represented here by certain so that blunting is there in the load displacement curve you cannot know that the differences which has come in the load displacement curve is because of blunting or because of real crack growth that you will not be able to find out okay so there will be some data which is saying that you have some amount of crack growth that really is not crack growth that is blunting okay so a sharp crack has just opened up and this has caused a change in load displacement and that is there in this data and you don't know if that is a real crack growth or that is blunt so how to remove that we will speak in the next class